Um, so today, I want to start with a question, and this is a, 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 a group participation question, all right? Um, one of the things that I loved growing up was field trips. I loved field trips because we get, it got us out of the classroom, and we got to go on a bus, and we did things fun. I was with my buddies. There were no desks. Uh, oftentimes, a field trip was a chance. It was, there was usually an object lesson or reinforcing something we had learned in school. So I want to know, what were your favorite field trips growing up? And you have to speak loud, all right? Um, because we, we need to hear it here, we need to hear it uh, for those that are listening online as well. So who'd want to share one of your favorite field trips growing up or that you just had recently? Yeah, John. Museum. Going to the museum, the Milwaukee Museum, maybe the Chicago Museum of Science Industry, always a great time. Going to the museum, yeah. You went on an honor flight with your dad yesterday. So you're still doing uh, field trips. Yeah, no, that's a good thing too, though they don't end. That's pretty cool, yeah. Walking through the park in the fall. Walking through the park in the fall, you did that as a class. You would just go out and, and take a walk, to like, or maybe go to the nature center, or things like, okay, other field trips when you're in school, yeah. Horse farm. You went to a horse farm. Did you get to ride the horses in, or just look at them? Okay, other field trips, yeah, back there. The Shed Aquarium, that's a great field trip. Nice long time on the bus, you can get in a lot of fun things. Yeah, that's good, yeah. Mr. Donut Donut Store. Mr. Donut Donut Store, wow. We're, I never got to do that one, never. Yeah. Theater. Theater? Oh yeah. That's pretty cool. I never got to go to the theater. Yeah, way in the back. Tubing at Timberley. Wow. We went to the Wonder Bread Factory. All right. Wonder Bread Factory to sell bread. Again, application to what you're learning in school. Yeah, one more. Oh, I never did that. She went to the sewage plant in Milwaukee. I bet it was pretty cool. Yeah, all right. We had so okay, she's like waving her hands here. One more. Uh, the Shoreline Nature Center. The Nature Center. Everyone went to the Nature Center, right? All right, we did uh, the pumpkin farm in the fall. That was always a good one. Sometimes we'd go over to the Capitol in Madison and get the official tour, right? We've, we've all taken field trips. There was a woman this morning that she got to go to the, uh, she, was, she lived in uh, San Francisco, and she saw where they made Mustang cars. And I go, hmm, that was pretty cool. And uh, anyways, we all had fun field trips. Always normally related to something you're learning in school. Today, we're gonna to talk about the ultimate field trip. All right, Jesus is gonna take three of the disciples on a field trip. They were not expecting this. They had no idea what was gonna happen. Um, but boy, oh boy, were they in for a treat. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. And uh, I think it's what I write down here. I wrote it in my notes. 983 in your, your, your pew Bibles. And you're going to want to grab those because we're just going to sort of work through this passage today. And so you're going to want to have it open so you can sort of follow along um, as we go. But let me, let, me just, um, let me just read the story and then I'm going to pray and then we'll get into it. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And he led them up to a high mountain by themselves. There he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun. His clothes became as white as the light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's so good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the disciples heard this, they fell face down to the ground, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. When they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for, for today, and we thank you especially for the opportunity to come together as your people. And uh, Father, as we, as we enter into this scripture and we enter into this story, Father, I, I, I pray that you would open up our, our eyes to see, our, our ears to hear, and our hearts to respond. And so, Lord Jesus, through the, 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 the mystery of your Holy Spirit, would you just speak to everyone in this room that we might leave changed and transformed. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, listen, I want you to notice something here. I want you to, to notice how it starts. First three words, after six days. After six days. Rarely in Scripture do you see something so specific where the writer of Scripture says, after six days or after two hours or after a month's time, after six days. Why would he put it there? I'm glad you asked. Which the reason he put it there is, go back up to verse 24 in chapter 16. I want you to notice this. Then it says this, Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be if a man gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? Okay, now we know why. Those are some pretty tough words, right? I mean, he says, if you want to follow me, he says, you have to deny yourself, take up the cross, and follow me. All right, if you want to gain your life, you need to lose your life. All right, and if you lose your life, you're going to find me. And then it says, six days later, here's my thought is that Jesus wanted these guys, this, all those disciples, that men and women that heard those words just to think on it for a little bit. He wasn't about to just go in there and, and start explaining things. He says, no, these are hard words. These are the words of discipleship. This is what it means to, to, to follow me. And he says, I want you just to sort of think on that. Let that marinate in your heart and your soul for a little bit. And now we get six days later, he says, let's go on a field trip. Let's give you an experience, now an object lesson of what I mean by denying yourself, taking up the cross, following me. What I mean when I say you, if you want to find your life, you need to lose your life. There's three principles I want you to see, three lessons from the story today. The first lesson is that Jesus is in the business of changing lives. Jesus is in the business of changing lives. Look at what it says in verse 2. It says, Jesus went up unto the mountain and he was transformed. He was transfigured. The word there is metamorphosis. Metamorphosis. It's like, it's, it literally means that your, your outside becomes the same as your inside. And, and so the example, of course, is a butterfly. It's the exact same word. That a better butterfly metamorphizes, right? It, it changes. It changes over time. And so you see something completely different. So what happened in the case of Jesus? It says that he went up under the mountain, and it says he was transfigured. He was metamorphized. He was changed. He was transformed into something different. What happened, friends, is that up until this time in his ministry, in his public ministry, all you saw was his humanity. But right now, at this moment, up on that mountain, with Peter, James, and John right there, it says he rolled away his humanity and his divinity came bursting forth. And it says that he, he sh his face shined like the sun. If you go to the Luke account, it says that when this happened, it says there were like flashes of lightning coming out of his face. I mean, this is true Star Wars, all this kind of stuff. There's this lightning bolts, boom, coming out of his eyes, right? There's flashing in this incredible br brightness. The Mark account says that he was as white as snow, that he was, he was like bleach, and that they had seen nothing brighter in their entire life. Think what it is to look at the sun. You can't stare at the sun for very long because it will blind you. It will do damage to you because it is so bright. That's what Jesus is right now. And the disciples had never seen that before. 
They never saw this part of him. But he rolls away the humanity, his divinity, his glory bursts forth into the world in front of the disciples. The glory that he had before he came from the Father, the glory he would have when he went back to the Father. For, but for in this instant, this moment, we see something that no one had seen before. The divinity, the glory, the majesty of Jesus. And then Jesus, what we learn from the story, is that Jesus wants to do the same thing in each one of us. That's the application. Because Paul takes this story, takes this word, metamorphosis, transfigured, and he uses it in Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Verse 2, he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Friends, it's the exact same word. And exactly what happened to Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration is what he wants to happen in our lives as well. It's the Christian life. It's being transformed into the image of Jesus. And the moment that you and I come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to take up residence within us. And the process of transformation begins. And the process of transformation is a lifetime process. You don't snap your fingers and all of a sudden you're transformed, all right? It's not a microwave process. It is a lifelong process. It starts the moment you come to Christ and it ends the moment you go to glory and you are with him. And what the goal of transformation is the same thing we see in the life of of Jesus. What he desires for each one of us to do is to roll away the old life, to get rid of the, the, the culture of, of, of this earth and the things of this earth and the, the thoughts and the actions and the motives of this earth. And so the, and we take on the culture of eternity. And so our language is changed. So we're speaking kindly to people and gently to people. We're, our, our actions are changed, full of love and compassion towards people. And, 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 and the, the, the goal would be is that we walk around that we're an accurate reflection of Jesus to the world. That's what it is to live the Christian life. And that's why Paul says in Colossians chapter 1, 27, he says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. The hope of each one of us bringing glory to God is the Christ who lives in us. We are rolling away the old nature, the old life, and we are allowing the divinity to shine forth in our lives. And what's the goal? To bring glory to God. In that whether we're eating or drinking or playing or whatever we're doing, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, we're doing it to the glory of God, to make him look great and good, to magnify him. They don't see us, they see him. And so when we go to work, when we go to school, when we go to the club, when we're hanging out, it's not us, it is Jesus. And the world is seeing little Christ walking around all over Milwaukee. It's exactly what happened on the mountain of transfiguration and what happens daily in our lives. And here's the beauty, friends. God's never met his match. You might be dealing right now with something in your life and you're going, I just can't get over that habit. I can't break that addiction. I keep having that same conversation with my friend. I keep on having that angry outburst. I keep on getting jealous of, with that person. I keep on speaking those unkind words. God is greater. He says, I want to change you. I want to transform you. I want to take that habit, that character flaw, that issue, that problem, and I want you to, to be more and more like Jesus. He's never met his match. And what he starts, he will finish. Paul says in Philippians 1.6, I'm confident to this, I'm confident to this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. What God starts, he finishes. It's called transformation. The first lesson we learn in the story of Matthew 17 is that Jesus is in the business of changing lives. The second lesson we learn 
is that Jesus does not want a part of our life. He wants all of our life. Jesus does not want just a little bit of us. He wants all of us. I just look, look, look at the story. Look at how it goes here. It says that then, okay, they get up there. Jesus is transformed, but now we have some visitors. Now it says that Moses and Elijah show up. They're thinking, oh, big deal. All of a sudden, just the, 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 you know, the clouds come and there are, there are two more guys, Moses and Elijah. But, but, but here's the point. These are the, these are the heroes of the Old Testament. I mean, these are the guys. Peter, James, and John, they have their bobbleheads on their dresser. These are, they have their action figures. They have their posters on the wall. They got the t-shirts to prove it when they go to youth group. Because Moses and Elijah, man, they are the Old Testament. They are it. Moses is the law. He represents all of the law in the Old Testament. He's the guy that took the nation of Israel out of slavery from Egypt to the promised land. He wrote the first five books of the Bible. I mean, this is the guy. And then you got Elijah. He's the greatest of the prophets. He's, he stood among a higher than any of the prophets. Matter of fact, if you look at 1 Kings 17 and 18, you'll fe- see the story of his power encounter with the God of Baal, right? And, and there's 450 priests. And then there's Elijah. And they have this power encounter. I won't tell you the whole story. You can go read it for yourself. But basically is this, is they said, Elijah, you have to prove that your, your God is really God. We're going to show you that our God is greater than your God. And, and so you have these, these, this, these, these guys that are just sort of getting in a little, little uh, tough, little battle, right, of words. And so finally Elijah says, okay, let's prove it. Let's have a contest. Let's see who can win. And so the, 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 the 450 priests, they made their, their big altar and they put a sacrifice on there. And it says they were praying all day long for God to come, to, their God to come down and start a fire. And nothing happened. And, and of course, of course uh, you know, Elijah, he's egging him on. He's like, hey, is your God sleeping? Maybe your God's taking a nap. Where's your God? I mean, he's really just making fun of these guys. And they go through the whole day, it says, and nothing happens. And then it becomes Elijah's turn. So what does he do? He gets 12 stones. He builds a little uh, uh, sac- sacrifice area. He gets a sacrifice, puts it on there. And, uh, and then he's, he's just about to pray and just about to call down fire from God. He says, oh, wait, wait, wait. He says, this is way too easy. He says, why don't you just get a couple buckets of water and just pour it right on my sacrifice? So they get a bunch of buckets of water and they pour it on the sacrifice. And then he's about to pray and he goes, oh, no, pour some more water on there. All right, so now the thing is just dosed in water. And then Elijah prays and what happened? <laughs> the thing lights up. And he shows himself. He shows his God to be more powerful than the God of Baal. And so you got Moses. And you got Elijah. And Peter's thinking, oh my goodness. Moses, Elijah, Old Testament. Jesus, New Testament. This doesn't get any better than this. He says, hey, Jesus, how about I build a retreat center? How about if we just build a little another Timberly or Fort Wilderness or something? And, and we're just going to have this really nice, and we're just, not, we're just going to stay here. We're not going home. This is too good. We got it all. We don't need anything else. Moses, great. Elijah, great. Jesus, the greatest. And then what happens? It says all of a sudden the cloud comes and it leaves. And look what it says in the passage. And Jesus stood alone. Because Jesus is the greatest. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And Moses, Moses and Elijah, great, but they're not the greatest. There's only one, and the one is Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, I don't want to be a part of your great things. I don't want to be with anyone that you think is great or anything you think is great because I am greater. Jesus does not want to be part of your great things. He wants to be the greatest in your life. He doesn't want to be a part of your life. He wants to be Lord of your life. Jesus is going to pay too great a price just to be an appendage on your life. He says, 
I want it all. And my guess, if you're like me, you have a lot of great things in your life, right? I have a wonderful wife, a great wife, Colleen, coming up on 40 years. We have four great kids, four great spouses, seven grandkids. They're all great. I have, I have the greatest job in the world, working with no regrets. I just love what I do. I, I wake up in the morning. I can't wait to go to work. I have a, a, a very nice house. I have meals on the table. We have a new great puppy, Lola. Sometimes she's not so great, <laughs> but she's a puppy. I have all these great things. But you know what? Jesus says, I don't want to be just one of your great things, Steve. I don't want him in that list of all the other things in your life. I want to be over it all. I want to be the greatest. And I, I want, I want, what I want in your life, Steve, is I want, to be, I want to be Lord over what you're thinking about and what you're saying and how you're going about your work and what you do at school and how you deal with your friendships. God's saying, I want it all. And so the question I have for you this morning, friends, is there anything in your life right now that falls un, out of the umbrella of his lordship? Is there something you're hanging on to or someone you're hanging on to that's greater than Jesus that you're not letting go? Maybe it's a secret sin. Maybe it's an addiction. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's your 401. Maybe it's your kids or your family. Jesus doesn't want a part of it. He wants all of it. Is every area of your life being influenced by the Lordship of Jesus? What are the lessons from this passage? Number one, we see that um, Jesus is in the business of transformation. Second, we see that Jesus does not want to be a part of our life, but he wants all of our life. And principle number three, lesson number three, the affirmation of the Father helps us in times of struggle, difficulty, and hurt. Look at how the story continues. It says that Peter, James, and John are there with Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And it says that as they were talking, Peter is talking and talking and talking. Did you know, never notice that Peter just has a way of just putting his foot in his mouth on a regular basis? That's what's going on here. Look what it says in the passage. It says that while Peter was talking, the father said, this is my son the beloved. I'm proud of him. Listen to him. Basically, the father just had to interrupt Peter and say, Peter, shut up. Peter, just stop talking and listen to me. Just friendly advice, free of charge. If you're ever with Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, just keep your mouth shut. Just listen. My guess is they can say more important things than you can. So the father just closes the mouth of Peter and he says, listen to me. This is my son, the beloved. This isn't the first time this happened, is it? You go back to the very beginning of his ministry and Jesus in Mark chapter 1, he's beginning his ministry. And he goes, walks into the waters of baptism. John the Baptist is going to baptize him. And it says that the heavens opened up and a voice from heaven said, this is my son, the beloved. Listen to him. But now it's different. It's different. It's different because the father knows that the son, the Lord Jesus, is on the way to the cross. The cross is just around the corner. It's just down the road. And so... He wants to affirm the son and say, son, I want you to remember who you are. I want you to remember whose you are. I want you to remember why you came. And so these words from the father saying, you're my son. I love you. I'm proud of you. Listen to him. 
was a way for the father to give the son a sense of security. That no matter what they do to you, no matter what they say to you, you are mine. It gave him a sense of significance, reminding him you came for a purpose. You are here. There is no plan B. There is no second option. That the only way for the salvation of the world is if you go to the cross. And so Jesus sensed it in his body. It reverberated. It galvanized his sense of security and significant and allowed him to move forward knowing that he was going to experience incredible pain, unspeakable torture and suffering. But he knew he wasn't alone. He knew the Father's love. He was reminded of his identity with the Father, part of the Trinity. And friends, it's no different for each one of us. It's no different. Every one of us has to be reminded on on a daily basis that we are his. We are his. We are his children. Every single day he's saying, you are my son. You are my daughter. You are the beloved. Remember, remember who and whose you are. I love you. You are royalty. And no matter what they may say to you, no matter what they may do to you, you're mine. And no one in the world can take that away. You've all seen the movie. I've seen it a million times because of the grandkids. But the movie Lion King, right? You've heard the illustration. I'll just share it one more time. Because it just brings this point home. Lion King's the story of of little Simba, who's the the, the cub, right, of of the king. And and his dad gets, gets killed. And, and, and Simba is made to believe that it was his fault that he did it. He could have, you know, stopped it. And so full of shame and guilt, Simba takes off and he runs out into the wilderness. And when he's out in the wilderness, he finds a, 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 a couple of friends, right? Timon and Pumbaa. And he becomes friends with Timon and Pumbaa. And they're hanging out together. But the, 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 what's different is that Timon and, and Pumbaa they, they love eating insects. And so this is all Simba knows. So now he's just eating the insects like, you know, the other guys. And yet he wasn't made to eat insects. He was made to eat meat and good stuff. And yet that became his life. He forgot who he was. And there's a scene in the movie where he goes to get a drink of water in the pond and he, and he looks down into the pond to start drinking. And what does he see? He sees the... A, 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 a picture of his dad. Just remember, this is Disney, okay? So just keep... And, and, and so he sees his dad in the water. And what does his dad say? He says, Simba, remember who you are. You're not an insect eater. You're not an orphan. You're not a stray. You are my son. You are the king. Now go back and start living like it. And Simba goes back and takes his rightful place. Through the word of God, the word says to each one of us every single day, you are my son. You are my daughter. Remember who you are. You are the beloved. You have significance. You have worth. You have value in my eyes because of who you are and whose you are. Friends, so often we live like orphans, eating the insects of the world, and we forget that we're royalty, that we are sons and daughters of the king. Jesus says, remember who you are and go back out into the world and begin to live like royalty with a sense of security and a sense of significance. Three lessons from Matthew 17. Lesson number one, Jesus is in the business of changing lives. He's never met his match. What he starts, he will finish as we image forth the glory of God to the world. Lesson number two, 
He doesn't want just a part of your life. He wants all of our life. And lesson number three, the affirmation of the Father gives us the strength and courage we need in the midst of hardship, difficulty, and pain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your word, for this, this story in, 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 in Matthew, in, in Mark, and in Luke. We thank you for the story of the transfiguration. And we thank you for the message we find in it. We thank you for the truths that are literally life-changing. And to think that you, the God of heaven, desires for us to be changed from the inside out and to become more and more like you. And Father, I thank you for every single man and woman that here today. And Father, I pray that no matter where they are in their spiritual journey, that they would be open to your, your transforming work in our lives to shape us and to mold us and to make us into the image of your Son. In Jesus' name, amen.